hello. Welcome back to In the Growth Space podcast. My name is David and I'm your host. I'm really uh, glad that you're choosing to join me here. Uh, I know that you could be any other place and you could invest your time in in a lot of different podcasts, so I'm really grateful that you've chosen to to be here. In today's world, culture of an organization is really so important, and so I'm bringing to you today a lesson that I did in a a six-figure mentorship program that I I taught uh, last year. And I think it's a really important uh, episode, and it's, it's a really important lesson as well. So many of our organizations give lip service to culture, and and culture is really a leadership function. And so we have to be able to grow in our leadership if we're going to create an intentional culture. The problem is most companies and most leaders they don't really know how to do it, and so in this episode. I'm, I'm teaching uh, an acronym uh, on, on, on how to get real with our culture. And I, I explain what that means uh, in, in this episode. And I think it's really important for leaders to understand that um, we have to be willing to change our outlook on our organizations. We have to be willing to, to get real with the, re- the relationships we have with our people, our own emotional intelligence, and, and being curious about our, our, our own emotional intelligence, as well as really making some accountability in our culture and, and, and creating accountability for our culture because without it, again, it's just lip service. And that takes leadership. So let's get into this lesson on getting real with our culture. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to have uh, everybody here today. Welcome to our Empowered Living Six-Figure Mentorship Program. I'm really grateful to be here with you guys today. Uh, Today is Saturday, September the 24th, 2022. And for anybody who might be new, my name's David McGlennon, and um, My area of mentorship here in the Six-Figure Mentorship Program is leadership and organizational culture. You know, every organization, and really every group of people for that matter, um, has a culture. And if you've heard me before, you know that I am a huge advocate of creating that culture by design rather than by default. And that, of course, my friends, is a leadership function. And if we're going to create culture by design, it's a leadership issue. And on the converse side of things, if, if, if a company has a toxic culture, then it's because of the leadership has allowed toxic behaviors. But before we get started and get into the actual teaching today, I just want to say um, – and, and, and actually, for those of you who've been on these calls before, I know we say this in every call, uh, you've probably heard it before, but in order to, to, to really serve everyone um, on the call and, and honor you in really what we think is the right way, um, none of the mentors, uh, in, including me here today, will be making any direct offers. So there's nothing to buy. Um, it's all free. There's nothing, uh, nothing to buy at all. Um, we're here, each one of us in the Six Figure Mentorship Program are here really because we want to give back to you. It's, it, it's our community, and uh, we're really proud to, to have this as a free program. And I think what this is, what's really cool is, is that there are so many uh, of the mentors who are all also on this call. I, I see, I'm looking at the dashboard here, and I see a number of the other mentors who are on the call too, listening and, and learning, and sharpening their saw as well. And I will say too that um, all of our mentors um, have phenomenal programs. And I, I want to encourage you too, if you, if you haven't caught any of the recent um, recordings, you're going to want to go back and, and listen to, I know Regina had a great, uh, great session this week and Eric kind of all of did, and, and, and Mike, Michael Howell, uh, just some recent, um, recent recordings that I know that you're going to want to check out. And you can do that um, just by registering on the elmentorship.com website. It's totally free. You just go to www. 
elmentorship.com. And we really encourage you to uh, connect with all of the mentors. Um, go to the, the, you know, their social media platforms. Um, I'm, I'm sure you can find all of us on Facebook, um, plus a lot of the other social media platforms. I'm on uh, Instagram and LinkedIn mostly. Um, I, I am on TikTok, TikTok as well. And um, I know that uh, you'll also find us um, all in the Empower Living private Facebook community, the, 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 the Facebook group. And, and that actually um, reminds me, um, if you're not part of the, uh, the Empower Living community on Facebook, please you know, come join us. Uh, check it out. So we, we, we really love for you to be a part of that community. Um, it's, it's an amazing community, um, and it's, it's positive, it's uplifting. And, um, and if you are in that community, I would just want to invite you to um, invite some friends um, who are like-minded. And, and it's really easy. All you've got to do is just go to the top of that page. It's, it's the top right side of the page, and you just have to hit that plus sign. And then when you do that, you can just go through and, and, and add some of your, your like-minded friends. Uh, invite them. Um, and, and if you want to connect with me, um, you can connect with me on Facebook. You can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, you can also uh, connect with me um, on my website, davidmcglennon.com. And uh, if there's any way that I can support you, feel free to reach out at my email, uh, david at davidmcglennon.com. And before we get started, too, I just want to say thanks to Paul Martinelli for not only for the community, um, but really just for the opportunity to share um, with you today because I feel honored to be a part of this six-figure mentorship program. Um, there's so many amazing mentors um, with um, amazing teaching and, and, and uh, information that they've learned and, sh and, and they're just willing to share and I just love being a part of that group and, and all of you who are, are like-minded. So, Paul, thank you. Thanks for, um, thanks for uh, putting this together. And if you, if you haven't been following Paul and Holly on uh, their journey with the boys uh, traveling, traveling around in uh, the RV over the last couple of weeks, you've got to go check out some of the social media postings uh, for them. looks like they're having an amazing time. Um, you know, it's, it's Saturday. It's, uh, it's really early for a, a couple of you folks, at least that I've spoken to so far. So thank you for getting up. I know that you could be anywhere other than here. You could be with your friends. You could be you know, with family. You could be sleeping, uh, but you chose to be on the call. So I don't take that lightly, and, and, and so I, I appreciate that. So let's go ahead, and I, I've got a teaching for you today, and it's, it's not a, a real long teaching, but uh, I know we'll open up for, um, for Q&A uh, in, in just a few minutes. But, you know, we're in some challenging times, and quite frankly, in times like we're in right now, um, there are few things like leadership and a performance culture that will help an organization to truly excel. And, you know, when we look at culture in, in any company, for that matter, um, it happens by either design or default. And, and what separates world-class companies like, like Chick-fil-A or, or Apple or Starbucks or, or any of the other companies that you know have just an amazing cu uh, culture they realize, and, and they've, they've, they, they realize that it's important and it's not a squishy subject, and they realize that it has a real impact on the bottom line results of their, of their organization. And they've, they've taken to heart the, the Peter Drucker quote that I'm sure you've all heard that, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And you know, there's another author that I really like um, who talks about culture and organizational health. A guy by the name of Patrick Lencioni. You've probably heard of him before. You've probably read some of his books. And he, he said something similar to the, 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 the uh, Peter Drucker quote um, in his book, The Advantage. And, and that book, the subtitle is um, Why Organizational Health Trumps Everything Else in Business. And I think that's a, it's, it's an important uh, component of, 
of every organization that that we be be healthy and we have a great culture and and, and in that book he 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 talks about culture and and health in an organization being the multiplier effect and for for whatever strategy that you have, whatever product that you have, whatever service that you're offering, you are going to go two, three, four, ten times as far with that strategy or product or service if you have a highly functioning group of people that are driving it. And conversely, you're going to go a fraction as far with that strategy or or that service or that product, if you've got a, a messed up dysfunctional group of people, because culture is going to drive everything that happens in your organization. Now, I'd love for you to just play along with me here for just a moment. There's an image that I'd love for you to, to just pull up in your mind's eye. And Imagine, um, if you would, just a, a, a boat, uh, a boat on a river um, or in a regatta, and, and it's the kind of boat that you see in rowing competitions or the Olympics. And as you visualize this kind of boat, just think about this boat in your mind. And I, I like to use this analogy because I think it's really relevant to culture. You know, if you've ever seen a rowing crew row, especially one of these boats, you, you see them rowing in perfect synchronicity, and their timing, it's exactly right. And, you know, when they, when, when they get that, that, that timing just right, when that happens, they just seem to just sail through the water, and they just, they're so smooth. And it goes right through the water with amazing speed. And they, they get to the finish line really quickly. I mean, they're, they're fast. But if their timing is off a little bit, it slows them down. And, and they don't go through then the water just as quickly as they would if they're all rowing in, in just that perfect synchronicity. And if, if they're completely off, they're going to end up going around in circles and going nowhere. And I, I really think that culture is so, so similar to that, that picture. Because where we can get a unified group of people together just doing things all in perfect synchronicity, man, we get so much power. We get so much more effectiveness in everything that we're doing within our organizations. But the problem is that most leaders don't realize that in order to get their people in that perfect synchronicity, that it's a leadership function, that they're responsible. Culture is a leadership function. And if, if, the, if the organization is going to create their culture by design, it has to be led by its leaders. One of the things that <clears throat> I found here in my own leadership journey, and this really is especially true as a father of five children, the better I lead myself, the better my team or my family functions. So no matter if you're a leader of a big team or a small one, or, or maybe you're simply just leading yourself, we've got to lead ourselves well and create a commitment to our culture. And, and I, I want to say this, too, um, before I, I get into kind of the heart of the teaching, is, is that if you are a solopreneur, if you have just one person on your team, and that's you. <clears throat> I want to encourage you to, to create your culture by design as well. Because when I think of culture, I, I always think of the behaviors that lead to our success. And so we have to assess those behaviors that we are exhibiting and we are performing to create our culture that 
that our, our clients experience. So, so let's, let's lead our culture by design. And in, in, in the lesson today, I'm going to teach us really how to get real with our culture. And that's my acronym, R-E-A-L, real. And I'll, I'll give you what that means in just a moment in case you're taking notes. Um, and, and again, whether you have you know, one employee or 5,000 employees, if you want to make a bigger impact on your own bottom line results, you've got to get real. And what that means really is just recognizing that the company culture that you have is a leadership and strategic issue. So if I'm the leader of my company, I have to look in a mirror. And if I don't have the culture that I want to have, I've got to ask myself, what behaviors am I tolerating? What behaviors am I tolerating? So as we get real with our culture, we've got to start with R. And, and, and R is really for relationships. You know, as, as leaders, we need to be building relationships. I mean, you know, if you think about it, how can we, how can we really lead if we don't have some kind of relationship with the people we lead? And to be effective at, at leading and, and driving a highly effective organization, we've got to be in relationship with our people. So you might be thinking, well, what does that have to do with culture? And, and I contend that it has everything to do with our culture. You know, our people and the way they do things, the way they behave and operate, the way we behave and do things, those are the things that drive our success. And in, in order to lead our people well, we have to connect to them. And, you know, that means that we've got to be interested in knowing them. We've got to, we've got to understand what motivates them and be able to relate to them. And that really takes intentional leadership. And I know it takes a lot of time as well. But <laughs> nobody said leadership was easy. <laughs> and, and, and I'll tell you, too, when we do create relationships, that sets the stage for leading your culture. So it's really setting the stage for your culture, and it's really foundational for getting real for, with, with your culture. And again, if we, if we want to be real with our culture, we have to have relationships with the people that we're leading and who make up our culture. So the second component of getting real with our culture is emotional intelligence. Now, I know that Regina is doing a happy dance and she's raising her hands right now. <laughs> uh, and, and I think she called uh, these moments that we have as leaders um, either a Will Smith or Chris Rock moment. And, and, and whether, whether our emotions get the best of us or whether we're able to manage our emotions intelligently, that skill as a leader is so important. And having that kind of an awareness and command of our emotions, that's going to allow us to lead our culture in a much more intentional way. And it's going to, be a, a, it's going to allow us really to have much more intentionality than if we let them get the best of us. So <clears throat> if we want to live and, and, and really lead our highest values, our, our, our cultural behaviors that I'll talk about here in just a, a couple of moments, we've got to have an evaluation of and, and, and really work on our emotional intelligence. This really is a key leadership competence that's going to separate both good leaders from poor ones, and a great culture from toxic ones. And of course, you know that uh, Regina has the EQ project, and, and she has the assessments to be able to find out where our emotional intelligence opportunities are, and really the ability to, to not be reactive and, and manage our emotions, that's going to give us such a, a mastery over our culture and our leadership behaviors, like, for example, practicing blameless problem solving or assuming positive intent. I mean, how can we practice blameless problem solving 
if we're reacting as opposed to leading our emotions and managing our emotions. So if we can, if we can understand our emotional triggers <clears throat> and really be able to capture our emotional energy to drive that culture and lead that culture, it's going to separate us. And, and, and I contend that when we lead our culture in an intentional way, it gives us, it gives our organization a competitive advantage. And that competitive advantage will be, and I believe it is, the most sustainable competitive advantage that any company can have. All right, so in getting real with our leadership and our culture, we know that we need to build relationships. We know that we need to improve our emotional intelligence <clears throat> And now, <laughs> the really hard one, accountability. So accountability for our culture is the next skill that we've got to master if we're going to get real with our culture. And, you know, when I talk about accountability in this context, I don't mean just general accountability, but I mean more specifically accountability for our culture. And what I mean by that is that how are we showing ourselves or the people in the world that we're, we're serving that we're really not kidding about our culture and, and about being serious about leading a high-performing uh, culture? <clears throat> and, and how do we show people that we're serious if there's no accountability? You know, and if we don't, then it's just a wish and it's just a, a, a plaque on the wall or a a, a platitude that we put up uh, somewhere in our, in our marketing material. And it's a hope that we're going to be a high-performing team and a high-performance culture. Now, there are a lot of different ways that we can, <clears throat> we can have accountability for our culture. And I'm sure that you know, some of you even do, do this first thing that I'm going to talk about. Um, <clears throat> but, but how many elements – um, are built into your performance review system for culture. I, I'm sure a lot of you probably already do this, but if I was in your company and I'm sitting with my manager and I'm, I'm going through the performance review that they're, they're doing with me, and nowhere in the conversation is any discussion at all about culture, what do you think, what do you think the conclusion that I would draw I probably would think that, you know, culture is, is just not that important. It's just one of those things that, you know, we, we talk about every once in a while or we point to it on the wall. <clears throat> and, 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 and obviously, it's not the only thing that should be in the performance review, of course, but I believe it ought to be in there somewhere. So if you're doing performance reviews, make sure there's elements of the culture in that performance review. And... Here's another example of, of accountability, and this is something that we do for, for most of our clients. So our, our clients' cultures are defined by um, uh, a very specific set of behaviors. We call them their way, and we call those specific behaviors their fundamentals. <clears throat> and... I already mentioned a couple of them earlier as examples. So like honoring commitments, that's, that's one of them that's, that's very common. Um, and, and what we do with our clients is <clears throat> we do this annual survey for our clients. And on the survey, we take each of the behaviors that drive our culture and we write a statement of what it looks like to do that. So for example, honor commitments. Um, that would say, um, our employees do what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it. And that's what we mean by honoring commitment. So, so we write that statement, and uh, we do that for each of the behaviors that define our culture. And, and then every year, we survey three groups. We survey all of their customers. We survey all of their vendors and suppliers and we survey all of our own employees, and we, we ask each of those groups, on each one of these line items, each one of these behaviors, in your interactions with us, 
do we almost always, usually, sometimes, seldom, or never do this? So now <laughs> we're getting real accountability. And <clears throat> this is a way to not only measure our culture, but really to find out, is this you know, a bunch of BS or are we really doing these things? Are we really, really committed to and doing these behaviors that we have created? So then what we do <clears throat> is we, we, we take almost always, usually, sometimes, seldom, never, and we convert that then to a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 scale. So basically we, we convert it to a net promoter score. And what we can do then is put a number on how well we live to our culture in the eyes of those who interact with us. And if you're into continuous improvement, then what we, what we can do is we can look at that score and, and, and what was that score this year? And how could we survey um, next year and, and, and look at the comparison or, or even last year and, and ask ourselves really, have we improved and, and, and what's our degree of consistency between what we claim our culture is and what actually shows up in real life? And that means that we're getting really serious with a lot of different things that we can do to drive accountability. But let me ask you this. What do you think is the single biggest thing that you can do the single biggest thing you could do to demonstrate seriousness or accountability for culture. I've asked this in live interactions with CEOs that I, that I work with all the time. And there's a variety of different answers. <clears throat> Usually somebody will, uh, will eventually come up with it. It takes a little while. But what I've found is the single biggest thing that you can do is to get rid of somebody who doesn't fit. You know, the thing, the thing is that every company that I've ever seen, um, they have at least one person who desperately needs to be transitioned out. They're pain. They're the opposite of everything that we say is important, and yet they're still here. We talk about them in every leadership meeting, and they're still here. And that's why I say this is a leadership function. And need I remind you that leadership is not easy. And this is one of the hardest things that a leader has to do is create accountability for their culture. I've, I've talked with a variety of CEOs. And just a quick story, <clears throat> one of my clients, he basically wanted to engage me. And he, he heard me talk. And he said, David, I'm going to engage you and you're going to help us with our culture, but I got to do something first. I got to let my, my, my sales leader go before we get started because that's the first step I know that I need to take. And <clears throat> what's interesting is, you know, this is just an anecdotal study of, of, of this whole idea of accountability. Um, but about 80% of, of these people that are, you know, just in need of being transitioned out and, and are the opposite of everything that we believe is important, about 80% of these people tend to be salespeople. Sorry, sorry, sales folks. But sometimes our sales folks just don't fit in with our culture. And that's okay. They may fit in with another company's culture. And then, you know, there's, a, there's another 10% that are maybe in finance and another 10% that are usually in, like, IT or have some sort of technical skill. And all of those people have in common something, and that something is something that we're afraid of losing. <clears throat> and if it's the last, you know, the, the, the classic salesperson, he or she is... is is probably in charge of uh, relationships with our customers or they bring in a lot of business. And, and so we're reluctant to get rid of them because, you know, we, we need that business, right? All the while you know that, that 
we're, we're basically allowing ourselves to be held hostage by these kinds of people. And we're telling then our, uh, the rest of our people, you know, our culture is really important. You know, it really is. Unless, <laughs> unless you bring in enough business. I mean, I know it's, it's a punch in the gut. And that's what we're really telling our people. I, I, you know, it's, it's hard to hear. <clears throat> but sometimes um, we, we have to look at our culture in, in this way. And I, and I know it's a little bit blunt, but the best way for me to really know what your culture is and for you to know what your culture is is to look at the behaviors that you tolerate. Because I don't care about what the, you know, the things are that you put on your website, the things that are on your wall in your office, but what you allow to go on around your organization, that's the real culture. That's the real deal. Now, if you've ever had one of these kinds of people <clears throat> that are, a, you know, that are a pain, they don't fit, and, and you've had to terminate them, when you did, when you, when you did let them go and, and transition them out, what did everybody else say? <laughs> I, I've talked to enough CEOs that most people say that, you know, they, they had their team come up to them and say, I, I was wondering when you were going to do this. <laughs> I'm so thankful. Thank you for doing that. And, and most of the CEOs that I've, I've talked with as well have said to themselves, you know, I should have done this a long time ago. And, and, and think about the message that when, you, when, the, when this happens, when you, when you do let go someone who's not a fit for your culture, when you, when you do that, you just send a message to the people who are, are, are really kind of sitting on the fence about culture. When you get rid of someone that's not a fit, and, and, and they're, you, maybe they're your top sales performer. The rest of the organization is going to know that, look, we're serious about our culture, and, and that's the loudest and clearest message that you'll ever send, that we're, we're accountable to our culture, and we're serious about our culture, and we hold our people accountable to it. And I know, I know that in today's employment environment, that's an even tougher leadership issue and leadership decision and behavior. And that leads us then to the L um, in our, our getting real with our culture, <clears throat> and that's leadership behaviors. And if, if you were on my previous teaching, I talked about defining our culture in terms of behaviors. And and when we define those um, leadership behaviors and those behaviors that, that really define our culture, <clears throat> they really become then our standards that we as leaders have to hold ourselves to. And, you know, as I said earlier, leading ourselves is the toughest form of leadership. But when we do it well, that gives us a platform to be able to teach others. And really, as leaders, if you think about it, by virtue of our role, we really are teachers. So if, if we're going to get real about leading our culture, we've, we've got to define our, our cultural behaviors, our fundamentals, our leadership behaviors. And then we've got to teach them to our team. But teaching them isn't just the only thing we've got to do. We've got to teach them, we've got to coach them, and we've got to give feedback on those leadership behaviors. And when we do that, when we, when we do all of those things, it sets up an environment of excellence and high performance that is going to set you apart from any competitor. And you're going to win. You're going to win not only new business because of, of, of your culture, <clears throat> but you'll win the competition for the best talent as well. And in today's environment, that's incredibly important because high performers, A-plus performers, are attracted to a culture that's led well, 
that's defined and, 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 and has emotionally intelligent leaders, has accountability, has relationships with, with their people, and, and is really defined by those leadership behaviors. So, so culture is a leadership function, and as, as, as it is a leadership function, we have to really get real about it and, 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 and develop those relationships. So, so getting real means relationships with our people and, and a competence in, in our emotional intelligence, having an accountability for our culture, and then creating leadership behaviors that are defined very specifically and that can be practiced over and over and over again, that, that can be, be taught and coached and give feedback on. And I know that I've said it before, but I, I, I really believe it's, what, it's, it's worth repeating here, that if you are that solopreneur, if you're, if you're leading yourself, I want to encourage you to begin thinking like a bigger company. Don't think of yourself as a solopreneur anymore. Think of yourself as, as an organization and, and define these leadership and cultural behaviors for your own company. Because I, I can tell you from firsthand experience, if you can tell your clients and your potential clients that your fundamentals are um, honoring commitments and delivering results and assuming positive intent, when you can articulate those and show your clients what your fundamentals are and what drive your organization, you're going to grow like you've always wanted to grow. And, and, and you will attract business like you want to attract business. So begin thinking of yourself as a company. Begin thinking of yourself as a bigger company. Define your own leadership and cultural behaviors. And let's all get real with our culture and our leadership. Well, I hope that lesson was helpful for you. Uh, I'm really grateful that you tuned in. And I hope that you will shoot me a note back and let me know what, what resonated with you. Um, what, what are some of your takeaways? I've got one more lesson that I'm going to give uh, next in the, in the next episode. And it's, it's really all about embracing change. And, and I think that as we look at going after our goals and, and learning to grow our, our, our companies, growing ourselves, we have to embrace change. And so I think it's a really important lesson. And I hope you'll come back next time. Make sure that you subscribe so that you don't miss the next episode. And until next time, remain in that growth space and be well. Mm-hmm.